Conveys joins me on today's episode, and we're going to be talking about decentralized finance, otherwise known as DeFi. So could you tell our viewers a little bit about your background? Hey, Alex. Uh, great to be back on your show. And uh, my name is Tom Vase. I am a content creator and event organizer in the crypto space. I started out on traditional Wall Street uh, uh, early 2000s, uh, into mid 2000s. I worked at Bear Stearns, JP Morgan, several other companies. Around 2013, I discovered Bitcoin and got very interested. Uh, by 2015, I had quit my job and joined this space. Uh, today, I mostly travel the world, speak at conferences, unfortunately not so much this year, and uh, run my YouTube channel, try to educate about Bitcoin. I have experience as a trader, uh, so I also run uh, a podcast about Bitcoin price analysis, and I educate about trading. And the three conferences I organize around the world are Unconfiscatable in Las Vegas, Understanding Bitcoin in Malta and the Financial Summit in Bali, Indonesia. The first thing everyone wants to know about Bitcoin is what is the current price? But Bitcoin has very strong fundamentals uh, that make it a sound value proposition and sound money. Can you talk a little bit about those fundamentals? Oh, absolutely. And this is what made me fall in love with Bitcoin in the first place. And uh, it wasn't about the money and getting rich. It was about understanding that Bitcoin was better money. And as more people recognized that Bitcoin was better money uh, because of one of its properties, uh, the fact that it will only have 21 million Bitcoin, and that's not a lot. Of course, each Bitcoin is divisible by 100 million, which is uh, pretty good. Uh, it makes it pretty scalable. Uh, in that regard, as far as small units go for now, and after that, we'll have second layer solutions. But uh, Bitcoin's monetary policy uh, of only having 21 million Bitcoin being uh, even more rare than gold uh, is one of its core properties. Uh, the other two are the concept of being unconfiscatable, which is why uh, that, that was the property that really got me interested in Bitcoin. I wasn't that much of a gold bug. So it was this unconfiscatable property that really got me hooked, why I own unconfiscatable.com and have a conference by the same name. And uh, prior to Bitcoin, humans have never owned something that was unconfiscatable, at least nothing of value. Uh, your thoughts uh, can be unconfiscatable as long as you don't tell too many people. If you have some kind of uh, amazing idea for a new product, a new company, uh, this is known as intellectual property. Your intellectual property is fairly safe as long as it's completely in your head. Uh, once it's out there, uh, it's uh, basically somebody can steal your idea once you've told somebody. Uh, Bitcoin takes this to something of value right now. Uh, and nothing else has that. Of course, you have to protect that Bitcoin in order for it to be unconfiscatable. If you let the bank hold your Bitcoin, it certainly does no longer have that property. And the third property of Bitcoin that is very, very valuable is the fact that it is censorship resistant value transfer. It's not always fast. It's not always cheap. It's not always private. But in order to get your Bitcoin to someone else, you don't need uh, a person or an organization or a government uh, entity in the middle. It will get there. And uh, that is also something that we have not actually had uh, over uh, digital channels. Uh, those are the three fundamental core properties of Bitcoin. A lot of people complain that it's not fast enough and it's not cheap enough and it's not private enough. Those are all secondary features. And I believe some of the smartest programmers are working on getting those uh, features into Bitcoin, making Bitcoin faster, cheaper, more private to use. But it has to be done in a way not to endanger the properties I just listed, which is why it's a slow process, but we'll get there. So there's a lot of talk lately about DeFi and how it applies to Ethereum, but it does apply to other blockchains. Can you talk about how it might affect Bitcoin? So DeFi, known as decentralized finance, uh, is a concept I don't really believe in. I honestly think it's kind of silly. Uh, it's no different than the ICO a hype in 2007 uh, because ICOs were never really decentralized. And we knew that. It was just a way to get around regulation. 
you launch your token on top of Ethereum because Ethereum built that functionality that the Bitcoin developers didn't want on first layer Bitcoin because Bitcoin was too important as money. And this is what people don't realize. This is why Ethereum is going to struggle. In order to be the best money possible, your money actually should not have any other use case other than money. Even gold has a use case other than money. It's not a big use case. Uh, it's becoming a bigger use case. Uh, but uh, if your money has other use cases, it's not a very good money because then there is this tug of war between what, it, uh, what is it? Is it a utility or is it a currency or is it money? So everyone built their ICOs on top of Ethereum and uh, Ethereum is not money. That would be ridiculous. And uh, Ethereum is a utility, but people are treating it as money. And, but they gave you that layer. So when those ICOs came out, people were saying that they were decentralized, but they're not. Some company creates an ICO and it even sounds like an IPO. And it's a way for your company to basically go public and uh, have unqualified investors all over the world speculating in your company into your token uh, to basically get you rich and you have money. And now you can decide whether you want to build that company you promised or not. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, no one is holding you accountable for it. You can walk away with the money or you can build the company. Uh, Ethereum decided to build Ethereum. Other companies decided to build. The majority decided to just take the money and say it was too hard. We tried and we didn't do it. Uh, DeFi is no different. It's exactly the same. Uh, it's just wrapped around a uh, greater level of complexity in order to fool many people. Uh, but those that managed to walk away from the ICO bottle, bu bu bubble uh, without getting completely wrecked or destroyed with their finances, uh, they think they're getting in on this early and maybe they're smart enough to get out before the full implosion. Probably not. And all it is is uh, the most popular DeFi concept is called yield farming. And basically, in the case of yield farming, you have a bunch of Ethereum or some other token that you're not really using for anything. So you stake it, you lock it up as a stake, uh, but you have to lock it up under a project that is printing its own token. Uh, it doesn't matter what that token is. And as long as you can uh, sell that token on your open market and profit from the sale of that token, you will uh, farm that token and uh, some company is creating that token out of thin air. They come up with uh, some kind of a document or a website or a flyer uh, that tries to convince you what that token is used for or why it's useful. Uh, you wanna, and they'll give that token away for free, obviously, uh, because whoever's creating the token has the majority of the tokens. Uh, they're giving away some of those tokens for free. And once you get that token, you have to immediately sell it because some sucker is going to buy it. But at the same time, the guy who's creating that token gets to sell more of that token and profit more. Uh, I mean, though each of those projects has a hype cycle. As long as people are hyping it up and it goes up, you know, you can keep uh, uh, yield farming it and selling it to some other sucker. Uh, but they're all pyramid schemes. They're all borderline Ponzi schemes. It's, there's nothing there. Uh, there is really no... There's no use case there because none of it is decentralized. There's no such thing as decentralization when there is actual, you know, when it meets the real world. And as long as it stays in a digital world, you can come up with these excuses that we're decentralized, but we're not. Uh, those projects aren't. The only thing that's decentralized is Bitcoin. I'm actually working on an article to try and explain what decentralization actually is. And I haven't seen anything that's decentralized in the crypto space other than Bitcoin, and this includes Ethereum. So Bitcoin reintroduces real value to money. What traditional financial instruments, if any, could be applied to Bitcoin? And how might these, how might Bitcoin miners use these to their advantage? Per, uh, traditional instruments applied to Bitcoin. You know, again, traditional uh, instruments, they do require some interaction in the physical world. If, you, if it requires some interaction in the physical world, then a blockchain is kind of useless. It's not very good for, let's say, real estate deeds because your real estate is in the physical world. 
And in the physical world, someone can take away and confiscate your real estate. So it doesn't really matter if the record of it is in the blockchain or it isn't. It, it's really irrelevant. So uh, there are some use cases of traditional finance uh, in Bitcoin, but most importantly, the most important use case is Bitcoin being accepted as money or as value for other instruments. So if one day someone wants to sell you Apple stock, they should be able to sell you Apple stock for Bitcoin. And that would be the most uh, logical use case. Now, of course, uh, Apple stock, anyone that owns Apple stock is supposed to be regulated and there is a record of it. Now, a lot of people completely disagree with the fact that the DTCC, which is the company that is supposed to be responsible for all of the records of all the stockholders. Uh, and I know that was Patrick Byrne's biggest, um, I guess, the white whale uh, that Patrick Byrne was going after. And sure, it might not be the best organization to keep track of people's records of who owns what uh, stock. But the other part of it is regulation. If regulation demands that there be a record of which person owns Apple stock, then Bitcoin isn't all that useful. Even if you pay for it in Bitcoin, you still can't do it anonymously. You still can't do it with the least amount of data. You still have to provide your data as to you owning Apple stock. Now, if we get to a point where uh, you know, people could own Apple stock without registering somewhere, uh, then sure, uh, having Apple stock on the blockchain makes sense. Now, will the stock market one day uh, be applied and where you're using the Bitcoin blockchain, this decentralized blockchain database layer for ownership of something like stocks? I don't think so. It's possible in the very, very distant future. But like I mentioned before, uh, this only makes sense if people are allowed to have anonymous ownership. Otherwise, it doesn't make that much sense because a centralized data database uh, would be a lot more efficient. But in theory, you can take one Bitcoin. Uh, it's becoming more and more expensive. But if let's say Apple decided to lock up one Bitcoin today. And if the project called Color Coins ever comes back or a new version of Color Coins, uh, this is what they attempted to do way early on, like 2015 or something, uh, or even earlier, maybe even 2014 or 13, where you take one Bitcoin, you subdivide it into 100 million pieces. Each one is called a Satoshi. And you assign a share of Apple stock or Tesla stock to that one Satoshi. Now, the value of one Satoshi right now is under a penny. So if you assign a share of Tesla stock that is worth almost $2,000 to that sub-penny Satoshi, the value of Bitcoin in this case is actually irrelevant. Uh, but now you can have 100 million shares of Tesla stock sitting on top of the Bitcoin blockchain, a blockchain that so far in its 10-year history has been immutable and has been uh, you know, up and functioning 99.999% of the time. So it's a way to kind of decentralize the stock market a little bit. It's a use case. I'm not sure if we will ever get there. Uh, it's debatable whether this is something that's needed. Uh, maybe in the US it's not needed, but maybe in some foreign country where there is no trust in the underlying layers. There is no, like the financial sector doesn't actually trust their own government to maintain these records. So for a foreign country that happens to have some very smart programmers that decide to do something like this, they could create uh, this awesome financial world uh, for the people in that country. But once again, the government can step in and say, anyone we discover holding these things, you know, you can get arrested. So it's not that easy. And anything that has consequences uh, in the real world uh, is very, very challenging when it comes to uh, this decentralized world of finance. Now, Bitcoin has a shot at avoiding some of this regulation, and that's because Bitcoin now has its, I was going to say foot, but it's starting to be more like a leg in the traditional finance world. 
with uh, banks now legally allowed to hold Bitcoin custody for other people. Uh, we already have a GBTC, which is not exactly an ETF, but the ETF might be coming. You have Fidelity is involved in Bitcoin. You have large hedge funds, uh, Paul Tudor Jones buying into Bitcoin. You just had a big company, MicroStrategies, buy a quarter million uh, dollars worth of Bitcoin as a strategic reserve. So it's becoming a bigger and bigger part of the corporate and traditional finance world to the point where it becomes almost impossible for these politicians to make it criminal to own Bitcoin because there's lobbyists out there and probably these politicians could even be invested in Bitcoin now. So uh, th that's, uh, that, that's, that's the good news. So there you go. But outside of the money use case for Bitcoin, I've really struggled to find a real need for this inefficiency and insanity of a blockchain. Look how much electricity Bitcoin takes up. Uh, let's just get this money thing down. That's enough to significantly change the world for the better. Uh, the rest of it, it could be more efficient in a centralized way. So it takes a significant amount of capital to set up a mining pool operation. Can you talk about how Bitcoin miners, just like traditional commodity miners, might use something like derivatives or futures to lock in prices or options to hedge? Oh, absolutely. I think the smart ones uh, should have been doing it already for a while. I remember we were talking about it on my YouTube channel around one year ago when Bitcoin suddenly spiked to 14000 uh, in, in April of 2019, we were still sitting at sub 4,000. And then by June, we were at 14,000. Uh, that's three months. Uh, in less than three months, we went from sub four to over 14. And at that moment, uh, Bitcoin futures, uh, three months ahead and six months ahead. Uh, the six month ahead futures, we're trading at like $800 above that $14,000 mark. It wasn't even 14, it was like 13,800. And uh, we did this podcast, I, I did it with a friend of mine, goes by the name Ugly Old Goat, and you can Google him. And uh, he was, he's big on that. He watches that uh, uh, spread all the time. That's what he trades. And he was saying how any smart miner should be selling Bitcoin like crazy right now in the futures market. You can lock in $14,500 per Bitcoin for the next six months. Six months later, I can double check the chart right now. But six months after the day we did that podcast, that was in the middle of June. So we're adding six months to June. So now we're talking middle of December. Middle of December, Bitcoin was sitting at under $7,000. It fell uh, over 50%. And if you were a smart miner, you lock that in. Uh, now, of course, the environment right now is a little bit different. We are pushing back up to that 14,000. And uh, I don't think, I don't, I don't see that kind of uh, uh, spread happening right now between the spot market and the futures market. We're also getting to this level at a lot steadier pace. Uh, we didn't move up as fast, even though we were sitting uh, down at $3,000 in March of this year, but we fell to that level only over a two-week span. So it's a completely different environment. I think that uh, we have a little more upside now. So while miners should be considering selling forward in the futures market, um, I think don't go as crazy as we suggested you do back in June of last year. So slightly different environment, but yes, uh, absolutely. This is why the futures market was invented. And uh, one of the conferences that I do, the financial summit, uh, is uh, one of the things on the website is recommended, hey, this is a week-long financial boot camp. And there's lots of experienced traders there, especially traders in the futures markets. If you're a miner and you don't know what you're doing uh, when it comes to hedging, you might want to spend a week with us. Uh, because that's where you learn. So a couple more questions and then we'll wrap. Can you tell viewers what to expect at the financial summit? And I understand it's the second year running. It's scheduled for the first week of November of this year, though Bali is still fully locked down. 
Uh, last, we heard a government statement about a month and a half ago saying they will open on September 11th to tourism. As far as I know, that is still the plan. We have not heard otherwise. Uh, this should be confirmed in about two to three weeks. And once that's confirmed, uh, we're definitely a go. Uh, at least I want to go and spend a week in Bali. So it's really designed to connect traders and hedge funds. Uh, so there are young, talented traders that could be looking for uh, capital, that could be looking for programming skills to take their strategy to the next level. Some hedge funds are always looking for new trading ideas. Uh, so that's what I really try to connect. Uh, that's the primary goal. Of course, I'm known as someone that teaches people how to trade. Uh, there's a few other uh, very successful traders that come. So there is an element to the financial summit. Uh, that's kind of like a week long boot camp. The event is six nights. Uh, uh, so it's like a boot camp with morning sessions being a little more educational and afternoon sessions being a little more networking between the two. And um, it's designed for the high, higher net worth individual, is designed for successful hedge funds, is designed for successful traders. Uh, so it's not a cheap event to attend. We're also at a very, very luxurious five-star resort, uh, all-inclusive. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really not, it's gorgeous. So with those kind of people there, um, exchanges are now interested because, hey, that's a very high quality traders there, plus but the potential of funds. Uh, high net worth retirement individuals are there. Uh, we really, I, I really don't want to be known for connecting capital with uh, those that invest that capital. Uh, but hey, we have uh, money managers there. We have hedge funds there. We have high net worth individuals there. If they want to talk, it's up to them. You know, everyone's an adult. Uh, so those kinds of deals happen there. So it's just, uh, it, it's just the one place where if you're a trader or you want to learn how to trade or you're a miner and you need to know how to trade in order to hedge your gains, uh, you're an exchange looking for high quality traders. Uh, that's where you want to be. Uh, that's, that, that's the place. And it's just, it's great to hang out with people that are like you. Uh, well, like me, <laughs> in the trading world. If you were a Bitcoin mining pool, what steps might you take to ensure your operation remains profitable going forward? Oh, wow. So <laughs> that is not my expertise. There is a reason why I'm not a mining pool or a... Well, if you're, a, if you're running a mining pool, you really don't... Uh, it, you you got to be competitive versus other mining pools. And the best way to be competitive versus other mining pools is to be as transparent and as honest uh, as possible. And this is why anytime I mine, they, I have a miner, anytime I put that miner to work, I always put it to slush pool. Uh, some of the latest technology that pools can implement allow the person that found the block uh, to have more um, freedom as to um, how that block is structured. Again, not my expertise, but the more transparent you are, uh, the obviously the lower your fees are, uh, towards the pool for its operation, uh, the better off you are. And that's great. So that's just transparency. If you are a mining operation, I would say uh, definitely have someone on your team that has experience in futures for hedging. Uh, futures or options for hedging. Uh, I also happen to teach an options class as well. But someone on your team needs to know uh, how to use these tools to hedge your gains because that's the most important part. Uh, the other thing that I would suggest is make sure you have a good fiat line of credit because the most successful miners have the ability to hold on to as much Bitcoin as they can for as long as they can. Because the reason why you're mining Bitcoin, uh, yes, one reason is you have an advantage in the marketplace. You can get your cheap electricity and you can earn money. But if you want to maximize that profit, you need to be able to hold on to as much Bitcoin as you can because Bitcoin does go up in the long run, uh, especially after big, big crashes. So right now we are pushing uh, a breakout levels. So this is when you may want to consider selling uh, more, a little more of your Bitcoin that you're mining uh, on average 
uh, because, well, not in, uh, not in terms of Bitcoin, but in terms of dollars to get some of those extra dollars because you may need those um, at the next Bitcoin drop. Uh, but, if you're, uh, the, but if you can have a source of fiat liquidity where you can borrow fiat when the price of Bitcoin falls uh, to maintain your mining operation to avoid selling that Bitcoin, uh, th that would be the best part because just hold on through a, a little dip and that's how you can make the profit uh, because Bitcoin will rise. Thanks, Tone. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for being on the show today. All right. Thank you.